So I'm uh, a little more than halfway through those homeworks, so I didn't qu quite get them done today. Uh, but they'll be done before I'll be done sometime tomorrow. Um, having that study day, I'll be kind of basically just using that to to go through, grade the rest of those. Um, I should be grading a couple couple more of them this, this evening, and then kind of responding to each one of your project proposals. Okay, so look for a lot of stuff kind of coming through on Canvas for for both the grade and that first homework, as well as you know possibly some some data sets sent your way and some responses for your proposals. By the time we get uh, to and start class on Thursday, okay? I'm also going to post after today's class the next homework assignment. Um, look, based off what I've seen, uh, you know, the grades are a little bit lower. I may end up curving that first first assignment a little bit. Um, I would say the most common mistakes I'm seeing is just really paying attention to all to the entirety of the question, exact everything that's asking you for. I'm also thinking about just because I ask you what happens to like say price, you know, price could go up, it could, it could go down, but don't always forget the third option in economics, which is often it depends. Okay. That potentially there's conflicting things that are increasing price or decreasing price or potentially things stay the same. Right? So kind of be complete in thinking about all scenarios that it could, could exist when you're looking at a particular problem. Um, but I, with the posted answer key, maybe this will become a little bit more clear for that first assignment. So you can take a look at that and see, you know, any points that you miss exactly what kind of would have been the complete answer there or kind of, you know, thinking about every possible scenario. Um, and like I said, once I get all those all graded, I might, I might curve a little bit. We'll talk about that, what that would look like on Thursday. Okay. So any questions before we kind of get started? Okay. And make sure I've got this pulled up and over here. Just to pop this open. All right. So the first thing we'll kind of be going through is a little bit of review. Um, this, in fact, was was kind of the last question, the last homework was was thinking about revenue sharing, right? So we left off last week talking about a lot of different things that impact competitive balance within leagues, right? So revenue sharing would be one of those, right? So does it change the competitive balance? Well, if we're having the same percent for every team. And I said, this is kind of review. One thing we said was that big markets are going to see a larger shift in their demand and marginal revenue curve, right? Because if I take 50% of 100, that's a lot more than 50% of two, right? So we're going to see a much larger shift for those large market teams in terms of they're going to be paying in more than they're going to be receiving, right? So hopefully this kind of improves competitive balance. We talked about this could you know, shift the optimal number of wins down for both teams, but more for the large market team, kind of bringing that gap closer together. We also said kind of some things to keep in mind throughout some of the discussion today was that profit maximizing teams, right, if they get this additional revenue from the league, well, if they're profit maximizing, they're just going to pocket that additional revenue to increase profits, right? Because it doesn't matter what they do, right, what they do with their resources in terms of targeting a higher or lower number of wins, they still get to keep that exact same dollar amount of whatever revenue was being given to them from the league. Okay. So this creates a problem, right? Because what revenue sharing could be even more beneficial if we were guaranteed that this additional shared revenue, specifically with the smaller market teams or the teams targeting a lower number of wins, if it was guaranteed they were going to spend this on their players, coaches, et cetera, well, then we would see a movement kind of higher in their optimal or the targeted number of wins, decreasing that gap even more, right? But we talked about their profit maximizing, they just, they just kind of pocket it and we don't get this, okay? So because this share revenue is fixed and not marginal, we might have this, this issue of kind of this free rider effect where the lower market teams just take the additional revenue, keep it as profits. We said if they're win maximizing though, then, then we, you know, if they were purely win maximizing, they'll continue to spend this money right, to improve the quality of their team, the number of targeted wins, bringing that gap even closer. Um, I actually think I have decreased, I should say increasing parity here, right? I don't use that word a lot. Basically improving competitive balance or kind of increasing parity, the, the, how, um, oh, there you go. How kind of equal these teams look, right? Uh, so, you know, if we think about some other things that we might be able to do, so even if we had profit maximizing teams, 
if I could guarantee that a certain percent of that shared revenue had to be used on player salaries, well, some of the teams might just shift their money around, but potentially we could, you know, kind of enforce that. If I'm sharing some of this revenue, you have to start spend a certain percent of it on player salaries that potentially could increase kind of the quality of the team that with, you know, both of those kind of going, going uh, both of those being simultaneously enacted, right? Revenue sharing and kind of a certain percent required to be spent on salaries. We also could create like league minimum. So we might could say something like, uh, you know, a team has to spend at least this much money. We don't see that as much, but it's a very similar idea to telling teams they can only spend a maximum amount of money, right? We think we'll get a maximum and a minimum kind of placed on how much had to be spent on player salaries. And we'll think about what that looks like in the win market um, later on in the class. But this is kind of a little bit of review, just some of the principles, principles we've already talked about. Oh, forgot an animation on something. So I guess you can ignore this for a second. So salary caps are actually bands. I kind of mentioned we can put a lower and upper limit for how much total either, you know, how much minimum has to be spent on salaries and at most how much can be spent, right? Kind of putting this maximum on there. So a lot of leagues have these. So the NFL and NHL have maximums, like upper limits of 155 and 74 million. The NFL has this kind of lower limit that requires a certain amount be spent on player salaries. The NBA has a soft cap. It's a little bit more complex. So there's not this kind of hard and fast. You can only spend what 155 million. There's some additional rules there. And it kind of has to do with, um, we'll, we'll die. I don't think we'll get to it today, but um, probably Thursday it has to do a little bit more with like, is the player uh, a veteran? Are they a rookie? Um, actually their performance. So it's based on things like if it was an all-star player, you can spend a little bit more money on them and it doesn't count against kind of that hard cap. So theirs is a little bit more complicated and we'll talk through maybe the advantages and disadvantages of that once we, once we get there, right? But if we tried to put kind of a, you know, kind of look at some of the numbers, upper limit of about 94 million, lower limit of 84, but they also do have this luxury tax limit where these certain criteria, if they're met, you can spend a little bit more than 94 million on certain players, depending on what their status is. And then kind of the unique league we have is Major League Baseball, which we have no cap, right? So we'll think about how all this, would, how this would look differently in the wind market, um, and also how these additional luxury taxes, right, will influence these teams' decisions, okay? So even though the Major League Baseball has no salary cap, no kind of maximum, there is a threshold for which it says, if you spend over this amount, you're now going to have to pay an additional tax. So let's think about kind of what some of these things look like. So in the NBA, right, we do have an upper salary limit, but they call it a soft cap in that there's certain criteria if they're met, that money doesn't count against that cap. So, I, you know, I, I'm not going to go over them fully in detail because there's quite a few of them. They all kind of work similar. So we've got a mid-level exception, which is that you can go over that upper limit if it's to fill your roster. If you just need one more player at the league average, you're going to fill out your roster. You're not getting this high, high quality player, right? You're getting kind of someone in the middle. The league allows you to sign one more player, even if, if, it's, if it's at the average or below, if it pushes you over the limit. Right? This is just to kind of make sure you can kind of fill out your roster. They have rookie exceptions, which is that if, if you're signing a rookie to their first contract, that's okay if that pushes you over the limit as well. So the idea here is all, all of these exceptions ultimately are trying to get the small market teams closer to those large market teams. Right? So the idea here is what rookies are going to be signing some of the larger contracts, probably rookies taken higher up in the draft. Right? We haven't talked about it yet. It's in, it's in the slides for this week, but every league, NBA included, has this reverse order draft where the worst teams get the highest picks, right? So the idea here is if we know the worst teams are getting the highest picks, but the highest picks cost the most money, we don't want to over penalize those small market teams who are likely at the top more often of those drafts. And so, we, you know, if the rookie contract pushes them over the limit, we're okay with that. That's basically what the league is saying. Uh, this Larry, Larry Bird exception has an actual name, I, but this is kind of what it goes by. It's basically you can re-sign 
a team that was a team, a player that was currently on your team, even if it pushes you over the limit. So once again, this is trying to assist smaller market teams who maybe if they have a young player who then gets really high quality, well, now if I have to re-sign that player, now they're going to command a really high contract and large market teams will be able to kind of compete with me paying that higher contract. If that pushes me over the limit, I have to let that player go, right? This is kind of that exception. If you're re-signing a player, you can have one player that if you re-sign them, if they were currently on your roster and it pushes you over the limit, the league says that's okay. okay. Uh, they then added a more recent one, and this kind of came, um, people have, have said that it was a result of Derrick Rose. The league didn't necessarily say that. But if you're looking at kind of a player's fifth year option, um, coming off a rookie contract, you know, as long as that salary isn't uh, what, over 25% of the cap or 30% um, if they want an MVP, then you can still re-sign them if it pushes you over the So once again, same idea. It's trying to allow small market teams to keep high quality players, even if spending money on them pushes them over that salary cap amount. So all of these really have the same idea in mind. I'm not gonna like ask you exactly which one, is, you know, what's the rules of each one, but all of them are attempting to allow small market teams to go over that cap amount as long as they're holding on to kind of players that, that started out in their team or kind of meet certain criteria. Oh, and what's the last one? Uh, they, they made a new one, which once again, this isn't the name of the rule, but people think it was a result of Kevin Durant and them wanting him to stay in, uh, oh, what was it, Oklahoma City at the time, which was that if you have a high quality player, right, they're an MVP, they were an all-star or the defensive player of the year, as long as that contract is, is kind of within a certain percent of the overall salary cap, the league would allow you to sign that player even if it pushes you over. So they all have the same intent, which is to try to keep high quality players at small market teams, even if kind of their large contract for this top level high quality player pushes them over the limit. So all the goal of this is that really salary caps, we think about our win market. Actually, I'm just gonna jump the gun a little bit. What, you know, all of these uh, salary caps they have in mind is that, right here, one, two, there we go. So if we think about models we've looked at before, I think this is gonna get really faint. Maybe we got an order for Sharpies and it's supposed to come in Thursday. So hopefully I'll have those before class. Because I'm starting to use them too much. We've got our number of wins here. And we'll keep marginal cost constant just for, for the sake of ease here today. Later on, I'll show you what happens. We, we be more practical and think it's increasing. But we talked about if we've got these large market teams right, and small market teams, we think of the large market facing a higher demand curve and as a result, a higher marginal revenue curve. Right? We then said, even if they're both profit maximizing, the number of teams, or the number of teams, the number of wins a large market team targets and the number of wins a small market team targets, and we're gonna have a gap in between us. So the idea with a, with a salary cap limit is, we know that this is gonna exist. We know that teams are gonna be able to spend a larger amount of money on their players if they're in a large market, because it will always make sense, you know, those costs are kind of constant here, I can bring in more revenue than a small market team, so I'm compensated essentially for these additional higher costs, right? I'm okay spending more money than a small market team because I know I can earn higher revenue. So we wanna try to push these large market teams back. So we talked about revenue sharing was one way, but the other way would be, is if we looked at this and said, well, look, I know that at this point, these teams are kind of profit maximizing. Their profits are greater than zero. Right? Where's the point at which their profits were equal to zero? Well, not until we're out here at this demand, where demand is, is equal to marginal cost, where we said profits would be equal to zero. So even if they're profit maximizing, I could say, well, look, I can think about this number of wins, and if each win costs a certain amount, there is some dollar amount that I could equate that to a salary cap, right? So I don't know, let's say the marginal cost of a win, it's 
easier to do like the NFL. So let's say, you know, a team will be targeting 10 wins and the marginal cost of a win is um, $20 million. I put the cap at 200 million, right? So I, I could, you know, take these number of wins and the marginal cost and kind of figure out some roster salary limit I want to set, right? Some salary cap. But what that's going to force teams to do is in order to get to this point, they had to continue to spend more money for these higher number of wins. And we're going to limit, you know, teams to, you know, these large market teams, pushing them back. I kind of call this, right? After that roster limit was set, we're going to force those large market teams to a small number of wins, but does it impact the small market teams at all? Well, they were already spending an amount of money that was way less that would equate to a, a dollar amount way less than whatever that cap is set at. So no, small market teams would stay where they're at and we'd push back some of those large market teams. Okay. Does that, any questions on that? Let me make sure I can see the chat right here. Any questions? Like I said, it's a little bit odd because, you know, to get this kind of um, salary cap amount, you have to do a little bit of work thinking about, we're really taking like the number of wins multiplied by the marginal cost of win and trying to figure out what that value is we want to set that cap at. Okay. Now, if I set a cap way out here, I can use the black one actually. If I set a salary cap way out here, what effect is that going to have? Nothing, right? It doesn't matter if they're win or profit maximizing, they weren't spending an amount of money that would have actually been over that cap. So that's how we can start to think about these salary caps in, in relationship to the, the win market that we've already looked at. Okay. And I will pull this open before I go to share screen so that if anyone's still kind of working this, I know it's not the largest, but you can kind of see this uh, down there in the corner. Okay. So this is the, this is the kind of graph, this is the image we're thinking about here. So how do these luxury taxes play a role in this? Because this is if we just set a hard cap. What if we think about someone like Major League Baseball where there is no hard cap, there's just a luxury tax if you spend more than this amount of money. Okay. So the way that this luxury tax is gonna work, and we'll use the NBA, kind of look at theirs as an example, but the same kind of concept would apply to Major League Baseball. Okay. So everybody got this, can I take this off the screen? see a lot of head nods and no one's protesting. So. so the NBA will also kind of cap individual salaries, right? So we have team caps, but we also have individual salary caps as well. Right? So they have this luxury tax to prevent kind of the abuses or, you know, we, we talked about there's like six or seven of those exceptions. We're like, yeah, we're not gonna, you know, even if it pushes you over the cap, we're okay with that but we don't just wanna let you do this willy nilly. We're gonna still charge you some money if you go over that cap amount, even if you meet you know, these different ex exceptions, these different rule exceptions. So we think about you know, for every dollar they spend over the luxury cap, each dollar is gonna be taxed a certain amount. Right? So let's say the, uh, the cap is, the salary cap is set at $100 million. As soon as I start spending over $100 million, each dollar I spend, I may now be taxed an additional dollar. So now if I want to sign a player, every dollar I spend over that salary cap amount is going to cost me $2 essentially. Right? So make, play, you know, make players I want to sign past that point twice as expensive. Right? Trying to prevent me from actually signing those players even if they meet one of those exceptions. Um, and I think that the way the NBA has it is it's like in brackets. So the first 5 million you're over the cap, the tax is lower than if you're 25 million over the cap. So if we look at these here, right? If you're somewhere between zero and 5 million over that hard cap amount by using these exceptions or these rules, then you're paying what? A dollar 50. So you're basically paying kind of what? 50% more than, than you would have, right? Instead of a dollar, you have to pay this 50% tax. And then kind of that tax increases as you spend more and more money over that, over that salary cap. And there's some like goofy rules down here. Once you start spending a ton, you know, it basically just starts increasing at 50 cents for each bracket. Like they stop at 20 million. If you spent 40 million over, it would be what? 
three $3.75 plus, well, you're 10 more million over, so another dollar, so $4.75. And then it's kind of a linear progression after that. If you're a repeat offender, notice all these are like a dollar higher. So what they're really trying to do here is there's like, well, okay, if you spend over the cap in one year, we're going to penalize you. But we don't want to penalize you too much. It could just be a year when all the contracts fell in a certain way that you ended up over the cap. And maybe, you know, next year, you know, because this person's contract is over and, you know, you try to restructure things, that now you're not over anymore. But if you don't try to make any changes and you're still over in consecutive years, we're going to really hike the amount of tax you have to pay up quite a bit. Really, what would this, what, what you can imagine this is going to try to kind of prevent in the NBA? You think about competitive balance, maybe not just competitive balance within each season, but what might this repeat offender kind of thing do? Yeah. So, yeah, so not just necessarily super teams, but also kind of like these dynasties, right? So it's not just that you could have a super team in one year. This repeat offender rule is trying to prevent you from having a superstar team four years in a row, right? Because there's, you know, or if you want to, you're going to be spending exorbitant amounts of money, right? So this idea of repeat offender is really trying to prevent teams from being able to kind of have this sustained success at the top, or it's hopefully going to help improve competitive balance with turnover in uh, you know, championship winners, you want to call it conference winners, you know, teams that enter into the playoffs. One of, one of those different measures of between season kind of variation or competitive balance. And I'm not going to expect you to know these dollar amounts. I'm just showing you this to, for the sake of a, kind of having some, having some numbers to actually think about. So that one's a little bit more tricky to think about how it would work in the wind market, but we can definitely think about how the Major League Baseball luxury tax could work. So right now, um, if you spend over $195 million, then you have to start paying a luxury tax in, in Major League Baseball, right? Um, looks like, the, I, think, I think this might have been, oh, so this is 2016 data. They had six teams that exceeded that amount, right? So about 20% of overall teams. So it's a pretty good, pretty good chunk of teams decide to spend over that, 195 million. So if we had to guess which teams, what, which teams do you think those are? Not specifically, but a category. Even the cities that they're in. We're probably thinking about teams like New York, LA, right? Our large market cities. Right? I said earlier, well, those teams, the reason why they're spending so much additional money is because the additional revenue is so much higher. So those costs make sense. The marginal revenue is still higher than the marginal cost. Even if you hike up the marginal cost by charging them this luxury tax, well, they're okay with that because their revenues are so high, it just kind of brings those two things a little bit closer together. But their marginal revenue would still be greater than their marginal cost. So if we look here what the teams actually were, so we got Chicago, San Francisco's maybe a little bit blip, Detroit was initial, but Boston, LA, New York, Kind of what we would expect. Right? So just like the NBA, if you re repeat offenders, I guess here, where you're spending over that salary cap for multiple years in a row or consecutive years, they start to increase that, that luxury tax even more. So the first time you, you go over 22.5%, right? The second year, it won't be 22.5% anymore, it'll be 30. And then the third year, it's 40. And the fourth year, it's 50, right? So, you know, this is really going to increase your, your cost via your salaries pretty, pretty quickly, right? Or kind of your, your expenses on players. So if we look here, I think this was like the last 15 years when I looked at it. Your two biggest offenders were the Yankees and the Red Sox. Now, I remember looking at this. And so 13 out of the 15 years, New York basically is just like, yeah. And I think they, hit the, they cap it out at 50%. So they're basically like, yeah, we're going to spend over every year. And we're okay paying that 50% tax. Boston was, was actually a little bit smarter about it if you look at the actual years in which they, they spent over that cap. So if I had a 15-year time period, what's the best way that I could go over the cap in the highest number of years without ever having to pay those consecutive violations? 
skip a year, basically. And if you look at it, it's not a perfect, they weren't perfect at it, but essentially they never were in consecutive violations in more than two years. They tried to kind of have a year that separated it so that they were living with that 22 and a half percent as opposed to that 30 or 40 or 50 percent. So why do they spend over this cap, right? So if we think about the wind market, and instead of having a hard cap, like we have here, right, let's think about if we had this luxury cap. I'm gonna to try to use the red and see if it shows up all right. And this one I haven't used as much, so it's not dying on me near, near as much, right? So we've got the number of winds down here on our x-axis. Once again, I'll just keep marginal cost constant to make it easy. This is what it typically would look like. And let's think about a large market team that faced this demand curve and this marginal revenue curve. Okay. Well, if marginal cost was constant, we could think about, you know, the luxury tax I'm paying is 0%. Right? There's going to be some dollar amount, right? Some number of wins times the marginal cost of a win because I keep it constant. That's all I have to do is simply multiply there, right? If marginal cost is increasing, each win would have to be multiplied by a different marginal cost. So that's why we're simplifying the model. So what I could do is say, well, look, after you spend a certain amount, you're going to have, I think it's 195 million, you have to pay this tax. So what that's going to do is I'm now no longer spending that exact same amount of money for an additional win, but it's going to jump up to what 1.225, right? Because the tax rate was 22.5%. So essentially, what it's going to do is increase my marginal costs past this certain point. We can almost think about at what point was that occurring. Well, that was the number of wins that translated to, you know, requiring you to spend 195 million on your roster to get that targeted number of wins. So now, if the team is, um, well, the way I drew this, we'll, we'll assume they're, they're win maximizing, right? You know, if, if New York is, is spending this additional, if they're win maximizing, where would they have been before? Without the luxury tax, would have been all the way out where the demand curve hit that marginal cost curve, right? Because that's where profits were equal to zero. Well, now, if I want to get to that same number of wins, I'm going to have to spend more money because for every additional win I want past this point, I now I'm paying not like one dollar, I'm paying a dollar and twenty-two point five or one dollar and twenty-two and a half cents. Right? You can almost think about it that way. So if I'm spending more money past this point, profits will no longer be equal to zero here, right? That's where they were before when my costs were lower. So now my marginal cost curve intersects the demand curve at a number of wins. That's a little bit lower. Actually, we'll do two stars here to kind of show after that luxury tax. So we kind of think about this was, uh, if you want to notate this like LT or, or luxury tax marginal cost. Okay. So these large market teams, they'll still be impacted by the large, or sorry, the luxury tax, right? Those large market teams still reduced their targeted number of wins, but if their marginal revenue and demand curve are high enough, they're still going to spend over the cap, right? Over that where that luxury tax starts. Any questions on that? Is that making sense? Okay with that? Now, what about a small market team? What if I think about where would a small market team be in this, in this graph? Well, I know that their demand curve is going to be lower. Their marginal revenue is lower. So even when they're wind maximizing, they don't even, they don't hit that luxury tax kind of cutoff, right? And so that's when we look at those top six teams, a lot of those teams, you know, they're from smaller markets. And this isn't just population, right? It's wherever kind of demand for baseball is lower. And that is a bunch of factors, population, income, right? They're never going to have to worry about, we'll never see them spend over the, the luxury tax amount because their demand isn't high enough, even if they're wind maximizing to support that. 
So even if the, you kind of think about small market teams that are wind maximizing here, they're not even, they're not even close to that luxury cap or luxury tax cutoff. Okay. So any questions on this before I show you one more thing. So this one was probably kind of what the, the Major League Baseball looked like. And this is probably about as far as I'd push you. Anytime we're thinking about taxes, if you want, you know, keep, I'll probably keep marginal cost or cost uh, constant. So it's a little bit easier to think about this. What would my marginal cost curve look like in reality, like for the NBA where they have these tiers, right? I remember the first 5 million over, it was dollar uh, 50 cents. <laughs> the next 5 million, it was dollar 75 or whatever the exact numbers were. We'd be thinking about a really similar scenario, but we could actually complicate this even further. So let's say they face this demand curve, this marginal revenue curve. Right? It could be that marginal costs aren't constant, but they're slightly increasing. Right? So maybe we kind of have these slightly increasing marginal costs, but then wherever that cap is set, I think it was, if I remember the number correctly, it was about 94 million. Once I spend any amount of money on my roster over that point, that would lead to a higher number of targeted wins. I'm going to have to start paying, like, because I have these exceptions, I'm going to have to start paying this additional tax. So it's going to change the, um, I don't know how I want to do this here. I didn't have this correct. So it's going to kind of cause this jump up in my marginal cost curve. Ignore this little guy. I accidentally drew that. Then I hit the next 5 million, right? So what said, after I spend more than 5 million over this, so what, 99 million? Then I see another jump up, right? And then another jump up. And another jump up, right? It was like kind of hit these, these higher tiers. So it becomes a much more complicated model, and I would never expect you to kind of never have like a homework problem or exam like this. But I just want to kind of give you a glimpse as to this could become a much more complicated model if we factor in we do have increasing marginal costs and we have these jumps. Right? Okay. So it becomes pretty a little complicated pretty quick there if we want to kind of build in something like that. Okay. Now the way I drew this one. I could still figure out where the optimum number of wins are because it'd be where does the marginal revenue equal marginal cost. It becomes a little bit harder if I had a marginal revenue curve that did something like this, right? So we gotta start talking about like kind of a discrete model. I'm not gonna push us that far, but just kind of showing you what, what could, um, what we could dive into kind of outside the scope or in a kind of higher level course than this. Okay. So does that make sense with kind of these luxury taxes, what we're thinking about? I mean, the intuition is pretty basic, right? You increase the costs, marginal cost is going to be equal to marginal revenue now at a lower number of wins. It's, re it's really the kind of, kind of the synopsis or the summary of the story there. There we go, share my screen. Okay. So that kind of left that open. That was kind of those drawings that I just, just showed you. Um, so anything else I want to say on that before we go to the reverse draft? Yeah, I want to do one more thing for you, actually, before we go to reverse draft. I'm going to change my mind here. I might, this might be a, a later slide, but I want to do it now because it fits in pretty nicely with this discussion. So I can get these filters apart. But the worst part about wearing a mask is I can't like lick my fingers to pull paper apart or anything like that. So we'll go back and thinking about kind of not luxury taxes, but salary caps. So this isn't like the most common thing that we would see, but this is an idea that I, I don't know, I sometimes think about, um, and some of the leagues do have minimum amounts that need to be spent on salaries, right? but not every league. And you think about well, what happens if they impose some minimum amount of money that was required to be spent on player salaries, right? Which we then think about, you know, is it improving kind of, um, team quality if they're spending the money in an optimal way, like trying to get the most talent with that money, right? So if we had, just for the sake of completing this example, so let's say we had our large market teams, this is an L, and then we had down here, 
are small market teams. So let's say a team in the small market was profit maximizing. So they choose the number of wins. Well, marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Okay. I then say, well, look, that's a really low number of wins. I know you have positive profits at that point. So the league comes in and says, well, look, I know if a team is spending this amount of wins times the marginal cost per win, you know, we could put a dollar amount on this. I think in the NBA, I might have had it up there with like 84 million or something. I know that you, or sorry, let's say this is not 84, let's say this is uh, 64 million. I know that I don't like it that your wins are that low because for the league, that really hurts competitive balance. And then for every game you play in, we lose out on broadcast revenue, ticket revenue, et cetera. So the league comes in and says, well, okay, I'm gonna set the minimum amount, and we want to think about this as like a team salary minimum. I'm going to set it up here, and that was the number I was thinking, I think was like 84 million, right? Well, now this team, if they want to remain in the league, is forced to spend additional money, right, to get to this high, you know, higher number of, or whatever wins that that additional salary expenditure would equate to. So they're going to go to a higher number of wins. And you think about, you know, we call this uh, S and the pool, pool guy right there, a little posture. So I've improved competitive balance in my league. Now this team salary minimum did not impact the large market teams at all. Right? They, they keep on doing the same thing, no matter if they're profit or win maximizing. It didn't impact them at all. But it helped kind of close that gap. And at this point, what's true about the small market team profits? They're still, oh, this was off the screen there, sorry. Let me know when that happens. The profits for that small market team, if they spend that minimum, will still be greater than zero, positive, all right? Now, so that's great, that's how it should work. That's how, if we impose kind of a, a salary minimum, that's how it would work effectively. Right? What is one issue we could run into by setting these salary minimums though for the team? Well, let's say instead of profit maximizing, let's say the team is win maximizing, right, at that point. Well, if a team is win maximizing, and I look at like the lowest quality team in my league, and say, well, look, they're just not spending enough money on their players. You, know, you don't look into like what their actual kind of revenues and expenses are. And you say, they must not be spending enough on their players. We're gonna impose, kind of call this team salary minimum two, right? A higher minimum, right? Maybe this equates to something like, I don't know, $90 million. Well, what's the problem if this is a salary minimum for those small market teams? What will their profits be now? Yeah, so remember, their profits were zero when demand hit that marginal cost curve. If I force them to spend additional money, they're going to be operating with negative profits. You can't see that in the long run, right? So, you know, if we're not careful with these, these salary minimums, we could kind of maybe drive some of the teams out of our league. Any questions on that? There's a lot, lot going on there, but I did want to give an idea about how kind of these lead, uh, salary minimums work, not just the salary maximum or salary caps we talked about earlier. Okay. All right, once again, I'll leave this... Uh, up here when we switch back. So the next thing that I want to talk about is something else that attempts to improve competitive balance, which is this reserve, uh, reverse draft, right? A reverse order draft. Okay. So if you're somewhat familiar with sports, which not all of us are, um, some of you, I guess, were, were just kind of interested in kind of thinking about different economic principles and how it's applied to something kind of outside of business, maybe even. Although you could argue yes, a lot of these applications are business applications. Um, but the way that these reverse order drafts work is, 
whatever team has the worst record at the end of the year gets the first pick in the draft, right? Or kind of think about these drafts or they're trying to choose amateur players, players coming out of college, players coming out of high school, um, or other, other kind of competing leagues, like, like European leagues, or, or even uh, I think uh, someone said something the other day about China's basketball league and kind of, they're, they're kind of drafting some of these players. Whoever has the worst record gets a draft first. So what's that gonna do for us, right? We have the worst teams drafting first and the best teams drafting last. What we're hoping is that those, <laughs> those bad teams can then make a good decision and, and draft the highest quality player. Right? If they then get the highest quality young player, that potentially, hopefully, improves their quality moving forward. Right? So I'm going to minimize this now because hopefully everyone has finished looking at that. So that's our goal, right? So this exists in every single one of our major leagues, right? Now, they don't all work exactly the same, but they all do have some form of this reverse order draft. Oop. So what draft do we think that this is? So what does it do or what, uh, you know, we think about during the season, what does this do to the incentives that exist for each win? Right? Well, this is where it gets somewhat problematic, right? Because if I get the best pick for doing the worst, if halfway through the season, I already know that I'm not going to make it into like the playoffs or whatever the, the kind of championship is, what might I, I think about doing as a team? Well, I could, yeah, I could start unloading some of my high quality players, or I could just, you know, kind of, you know, not really make any additional moves, not sign free agents. You know, I could try to do take steps to win less, right? Because now, if I know I can't win everything, or I can't make it to the playoffs, well, now that there's actually somewhat of a disincentive to win, right? And that disincentive is I'm less likely to get one of these higher draft picks. So good teams are going to be largely unaffected because, well, they know that they're probably, you know, even if they don't do anything, they're probably still going to make the playoffs. They'll still have a good enough record where they can't get one of those low picks. So there's no disincentive for them to win. But these bad teams, if they continue to win, you know, at the end of the season after they already know that they're going to be near the bottom, well, they want to make sure if they're near the bottom, they're at the very bottom, right? If I'm, if I'm going to be kind of one of those, those uh, bad teams that I'm not going to have any success this year, I want to make sure I have the least success in just in relationship to the draft picks, right? So although the intent of this draft, reverse order draft is good, right? It's, it's trying to get higher quality players on the low quality teams for your competitive balance within the season it can actually make it worse, right? It can actually drive those bottom teams to go even further kind of towards zero wins essentially, right? So if we think about what league might have the biggest problem with tanking, right? This is kind of what we, we usually refer to this as the, uh, I don't want to say like actions that are making it more likely we lose, right? That's kind of the idea of tanking. I'm trying to lose games to get one of these high draft picks to get a high quality player in the following year. So I'm not necessarily like, you could argue a couple of these. So I guess just kind of general discussion, which, which of these leagues, so football, basketball, baseball, Hockey, which one of these might we think has the biggest problem with tanking? Yeah. So you could argue the NFL. Why would you argue the NFL? Yeah, so we haven't talked about the lottery system yet, but you're right, right? So the NFL, right? you're thinking about we have fewer games. So if I win a game, the disincentive to winning one more game is, is, is relatively high because, you know, if I win one more game in the NBA, I could still lose 10 more, right? But, but there, there's many more games that I could kind of overcome that one additional win. So that's, that, that I, I would agree with you there. There's one, let's assume we don't have the lottery in the NBA, right? If you're just the worst team, you get the worst pick in all these leagues. I want to kind of use this discussion to think about kind of another principle. So you could still argue the NFL has the highest, 
what types of, what's maybe a trend we see in the top pick of NFL drafts? Typically you see, yeah, quarterbacks taken. Why do you see quarterbacks taken? They can win you a lot of games or essentially the number of additional wins, that marginal product is much higher for that position. So those first few spots are really coveted because potentially supply is relatively low of high quality quarterbacks and the impact they can have at right, the additional number of wins they can bring to a team is very high. Right? Now for any other position in the NFL, you probably would argue like how, how much are they really going to increase your number of wins? So there's one other, you know, if I'm thinking about other arguments here, you can maybe argue the NBA could have a really big problem with tanking in that it has the fewest number of players on the field or the court at one time. So if I, even if I just believe that every single player had the exact kind of equal, you know, effect, right? One fifth or one eleventh or whatever it is. Well, the NBA, any one player can have a much higher impact because they're a much higher proportion of the players on the field, right? Or on the court, I guess, you know, whatever, just depending on what sport we're looking at. So, you know, there's, are, and you, you, know, you could argue some of the other ones too. Like, I don't honestly know enough about hockey to, to know if like a goalie actually, I like, haven't looked at the numbers to know if a goalie can actually impact the game a lot. You know, and you might be able to argue there that, yeah, they, they're so, it's kind of like quarterbacks in the NFL, right? That they can have such an impact on the game. They can really change, add a high number of additional wins. They may have a problem with tanking. But I just want to use that kind of discussion, thinking about players and starting to think about that. The number of additional wins players add in, in different sports may vary, right? Depending on the number of players, differences in the, the impacts of different positions, things like that. Okay. Uh, did I just repeat this slide? Yeah, basically. So I, I kind of actually repeated this slide right here. Um, and kind of, so what I wanted to do is have this on one slide where I had this question and then replaced it right here. So, right, we just had that discussion about tanking. So what would a solution maybe be to this tanking problem? We kind of already jumped the gun. I mentioned that any one NBA player might have a larger impact because they're just fewer players on the court. And so they created, the NBA actually did create a lottery system. So they said, look, you know, once these teams realize they're going to have a bad season, they just start giving up, right? They start having these terrible rosters, sitting players. How can we prevent them from doing that? Well, if you're not guaranteed that first pick from having the worst record, and we actually just create some type of a, a lottery system where, yeah, your chances are higher, but it's not guaranteed. Well, now you've taken that like disincentive of winning from like 100% to you know, 20 or whatever the you know, percent chances of that lottery. So, um, you know, what, would it be effective you know, then at, at proving the you know, parity within that one season, preventing teams from tanking? You know, this assumes a couple things. One, that, you know, teams can evaluate talent correctly once they get that top pick or, or you know, when they're looking at the draft. And then also it kind of assumes that, you know, this reverse draft order, it's going to have a higher impact if the um, marginal productivity, right? All right, I put utility here, but really for the team, that's the productivity of the player, if it diminishes quickly. So let's think about this, like, if I had a draft, right? And there's very little difference from the highest quality player to the lowest quality player. Well, it doesn't matter which pick I get, right? If there's not very much difference in them. But if the highest quality player, you know, if there's a significant difference between them and even the second best player, well, then I really covet having that number one pick, right? So the quicker that that productivity diminishes, the more valuable this reverse order draft is at improving competitive balance. Um, and once again, that's assuming that these, these low market or low quality teams or low, small market teams can evaluate talent you know, correctly. So there's this, this article, um, I think we'll pull it open here. Take a quick look at it because it's kind of interesting. So let me see, I know there's some good graphs down here. So here's, here's a good one. Um, if you think about kind of the, the value that players have, 
So this paper goes in this kind of, kind of complicated estimation of trying to get a good measure of the performance of a player, the number of additional wins they add once they're already in the NFL, right? So it tries to get this measure of how many additional wins a player was adding. It then wants to, it then looks at, just give you kind of a, something to think about here or visualize. It then thinks about, okay, I've got this measure of kind of performance or quality. You can almost think about this as a quality of the player. It then kind of just does a regression on, what do I want to call this? Uh, like their pick number, like where they were, where were taken in the draft. And then tries to get an estimate for that relationship, right? So as that pick gets closer to one, what was that correlation with performance, right? And if we look here on this graph, oh, this is pretty crooked, my bad. If you look at the graph they have here, this kind of is, is trying to show you or allude to what that coefficient's gonna end up being. So we go from the first pick down to the 161st. If we then plotted all these different players' performances who were taken in those different draft positions, notice it's a pretty, like, that, the number of additional wins, that, that kind of performance that, uh, measure, that falls pretty quickly from about one to 30, right? The first pick to the 30th pick. So that's our first round, right? So we've got a really quick diminishing marginal productivity in the NFL. This was specifically in the NFL. And then kind of notice from there on out, from like the second round to what? I don't know, the fifth, fifth somewhere in mid, mid fifth round, doesn't really diminish near as quickly, right? And so that's why teams don't necessarily value having a pick in the third versus the fourth round. And there's not a lot of variation in the players they might be able to get. But the picks within that first round, man, it's really, those first few picks are gonna be really, really high quality players as opposed to the quality of the players at the very bottom of that first round. Okay. So this is just a great graph. And like I said, they drew a line of best fit here, but they actually plotted out a bunch of different players that were taken in all these different picks. Uh, I think they have another graph in here that was kind of interesting or some results. Let me see if I can find where it's at. Oh, that's not what I want. Oh, here we go. So we've got that kind of quick diminishing kind of marginal productivity of the players. They then kind of do this, this additional thing, which I'm not going to dive into, but it's pretty interesting if you read their results, which is that if you were to trade some of these picks, that the value of what you can actually get for those picks is relatively high initially and then kind of decreasing over time. But there's almost this sweet spot that if you trade these picks in kind of the lower, because the picks at the end of the first round have a lower value, right? It's easy, you have to give up less to get them, but their actual ability is still relatively high that these kind of picks around the end of the first round, beginning of the second round, are actually where if you trade for them, you get the most surplus, right? You give up less, but gain more than kind of these additional picks. So that's a pretty interesting paper, and it kind of is related to what we're talking about. So I always like to, to kind of just take a, take a quick look at it. Um, but I'm not, don't worry about like having a great understanding of this paper. I just think it's kind of an interesting thing to bring up here. And it kind of supports some of the stuff that we were talking about is quick, you know, quickly diminishing marginal productivity of players. Okay. So this is kind of a summary of that. We don't have to worry too much about that. Um, you know, I just, if you're more interested in, you can kind of ask me. Sometimes I do this as like the paper we dive into for the week, but I have a different one that I want to do this week, which I'll, I'll get posted after class today. Um, so we'll go past this. I kind of already gave you a summary of, of that paper. So. How would trading draft picks affect the effectiveness on competitive balance? Right. One thing we talked about on Thursday was this invariance principle, right? And it actually really shouldn't matter that much because the teams that will trade for the draft picks will be the teams that value them the most. Right? So let's say something goes, goes weird, like a team has an injury. So they end up being one of the lower quality teams. Well, the whole idea of this reverse order draft was to close the gap in our high and our low quality teams, our large and small market. 
Well, if one of those large market teams, let's say we'll use the NFL because we kind of had a little bit of discussion, but their quarterback gets injured, they don't have a backup. So if they go from maybe being one of the top teams in the league to one of the worst that year, they end up doing the worst, they get the top pick. But we don't want that as a league. But that team also looks at that first pick or first round pick and says, well, there's not near as much value to me having that number one pick because my quarterback's going to be next back next year, right? He was injured this year, but he's going to be back. So I'm not going to draft another high quality quarterback. And these other teams that just missed out, right? They didn't have any injuries, but they were still low quality. They're going to value that top pick the most. So they're going to be the ones that trade for it. Once again, whoever values a player the most, we said no matter what the rights were to that player, the team that valued the most would still end up with them unless we had high transaction costs. Same idea here. Whoever values that pick the most will end up tr giving up the most to get it. And therefore it didn't matter who owned the rights to that draft pick originally, the, the team that values that, that pick the highest will trade for it, right? So the invariance principle kind of helps this reverse reverse order draft still be effective even if we have one of these kind of weird things where like a player gets injured and, and a team of, of really high quality actually ends up kind of at the top top end of the draft. Okay. So uh, this is kind of what I, I just mentioned here, right? If you already have a good quarterback, you're not going to value those top picks as much. So, you, you know, you're going to trade them the teams that do. Okay. Um, and then teams that have poor quarterback talent, well, if they end up, you know, there are no injuries throughout the year and the worst team ends up with the top pick, well, they're going to value it the most, so they don't trade it away, they use it, right? Either way, it didn't matter who had that top pick, the team that ends up getting it is that team that had low-quality quarterback or valued that pick the most. Right? So here's just another good example of the invariance principle kind of, kind of playing out. Right? Oops, sorry. So if we look at, like, historic, historical data, and I've never seen someone, like, really dive into this, um, and, and I know that you all kind of gave me a, a proposal, but if... If at any point when you're working on yours, you want to tweak it a little bit or kind of take it in a slightly different direction, by all means, always feel free to kind of, kind of let me know and kind of see if that's okay and if that would work. But I've never seen someone really break down even just the numbers of um, how many teams we see trading away top picks and like the qualities, like is it large versus small market or kind of what, what that looks like. But what we'd expect is that the large market teams are going to be more likely to trade for those top picks, right? You know, holding quality constant. That's the problem, right? Because the large market teams are usually going to be of higher quality. So they're not going to get that, you know, value that top pick the most. But if we somehow were able to run this regression where we hold quality constant, we would expect that larger market teams will value those picks the most, right? Because if they can get the best player, well, that player can bring in a much higher additional amount of revenue in New York relative to Charlotte. I'm picking on Charlotte, but it's only because it's one of the smaller, smaller cities. Right? So we would see large markets be more likely to trade if we could hold quality constant. Smaller markets, um, sorry, large market teams more likely to trade for, small market teams more likely to trade away through those picks. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, yeah, out of time. Out of time. All right, we got a little bit early here today, but I want to go through a couple more things. So this idea of competitive balance, um, something that's kind of interesting that the, these leagues will do is they'll do some schedule adjustments, right? So this actually seems to me, if like you're a pure, uh, you could argue this is like a, uh, I'm purely interested in the sport and I want to see the, the bet, you know, most uh, uh, equal treatment of every team. This is going to seem a little bit weird. And some people don't even realize this exists, right? But for example, if we use the NFL as an example, and I forget, I don't want to say something that's not true. I don't think this is the case in Major League Baseball. I think that the NHL does this, and I believe, I don't think the NBA does. I think they have a high enough game zone to do it, but I, I, I could be wrong on that one. So what the NFL does, though, and what every league could do if they wanted to, is two games for every team um, are played outside the division. So, you know, in, in the NFL, you have kind of two conferences, and in each one of those conferences, you have different divisions. So everyone in your division 
you play actually twice every year. Right? So two of the games that you play outside your division, but within your same conference. So uh, I, and this is where I should probably have a better, better recollection of what teams are in which divisions. But if you didn't know, you know, the NFL wouldn't matter anyways. So of these teams that are outside your division, but in the same conference, you have two of those games. What you'll do is you're matched up. The scheduling matches you up based on what your previous year's finish was. So let's say I've got division one and division two, and they're within the same conference. The third place team within each division would play each other that next year. Right? So it's trying to make sure that I get more games where the teams are more evenly matched. Why would the league want to do this? You would then have more games with a more uncertain outcome, right? We, we talked about you know, from, from data, from some different research, uh, different studies that have been done, people will more likely to attend, pay higher ticket prices, when the outcome of the match is uncertain. We have more competitive balance even within the same game. So by matching up the first, the, you know, first ranked team in each division, then the second ranked team in each division, the third, we're guaranteeing games that are gonna be high, you know, higher, um, are gonna bring in higher revenue because they're less certain of what the outcome is gonna be. The teams are more evenly matched, okay? So, you know, if we, I think I have some actual names here, but like the NFC West and the NFC East will play the kind of the third best team Sorry, the NFC West will play the third best team in both the NFC East and then the third best team that was in the NFC North, right? So every other division in their conference, they play kind of the same level that they were at in the previous year. Right? So that, you know, really helps us out in two dimensions. It's going to help out in competitive balance within the next season. Um, but you also think about for these lower quality teams, it's going to make it more likely that they can amass a higher number of wins, Right? Because if I'm the fourth ranked team in a division and I have to go up against the first ranked teams in other divisions, I'm more likely to lose those games. Right? So not only for that one game will it help improve, you know, competitive balance in the league, but it also at the end of the season, kind of win loss records will be more, more equal as well. Now, why might this seem kind of like an unfair thing? I use the third best, yeah. Yeah, make it pretty hard for the best team, right? They now have to go up against the best component in both the other divisions, right? But for the league, in terms of raising the highest amount of revenue and in kind of decreasing this quality gap or this number of win gap between the you know, best and worst teams, it does a good job at that. First, you know, first ranked teams aren't going to like it, but, but the league likes it a lot, okay? Um, we already talked a little bit about these promotion leagues. I think, um, you know, we talked about how are they going to be better at improving competitive balance. Well, this was the idea that if I don't do well, I can be demoted from that top league, right? So it's going to create a pretty strong incentive for every team to do well. If I have a promotion league, what's something we talked about earlier today that I really don't have to worry about? We're talking about it in relationship to the draft. So you, well, you wouldn't have to worry for sure about a salary minimum, right? Because there's a strong incentive for these teams to win. So if there's a strong incentive for the teams to win, we don't have to worry about tanking either, right? Because if, if tanking means I get bumped down to the next lowest division where marginal revenue takes a significant decrease, we're not going to really have to worry too much about that. So kind of, you know, these promotion leagues really help us deal with some of those issues, right? Um, so if you look at the variance in, in team wins, it's much lower in the Premier League than it is in any of our kind of top four American leagues. Well, Canada might be mad that I included NHL there, but right, the top four leagues we think about professional sports here, much, much higher variation in the number of wins than we see in the Premier League. Okay? And that's because of this additional incentive that I don't want to get dropped down to the lower league or lower division if you want to think about that. Um, so I kind of already mentioned this, but like the teams at the bottom, right, they're not going to take years off. They're not going to tank, right? There's an incentive to win now, stay in this top level lead. So the turnover, however, is much, much worse in, these, in the Premier League, right? 
So when you think about turnover at the, uh, at the top, right? Why might that be worse than in kind of our, our standard like four leagues we typically think about here in the US? Let's think about the teams at the bottom of this Premier League. We just said there's a strong incentive to win now and stay in this league, right? But that means I, I can't take years off, right? So if I can't restructure contracts so that maybe I'm bad for a couple years, but then I'm really good. I can't do that in the Premier League. Otherwise, by the time I'm really good, I won't be in the Premier League, right? I, I've been bad, you know, I got bumped down. And so I kind of like, it forces those teams at the bottom of the league just kind of stay afloat, right? Stay there, stay in the, in the Premier League, but never be able to make decisions that allow them to maybe take some of the money from this year and put it towards the following year so that we can really get in a bump in quality. So therefore, those teams at the bottom just kind of float and the teams at the top just stay at the top. Right? So we don't see a lot of turnover in the Premier League, or I shouldn't say a lot, as much turnover in the Premier League as we do in kind of our our typical four professional leagues we think about here in the United States, right? So they can't take years off. They can't rebuild or restructure these contracts. Otherwise they get demoted. Okay. All right. So we'll pick up with this idea of like taking years off um, next class, talking about a little bit more about competitive balance. I, I might add in some additional slides. Uh, I, I, this might take us a while to get through all this, um, but I want to make sure I, oops, I was going to switch to me. I want to make sure we have enough material um, so, so we have, uh, you know, if we have a little extra time, we can kind of go through it. So I'll probably update that, that PDF and, and that PowerPoint file, but we may not get to some of the stuff I add in. We may get to it. I just want to kind of do that in, just in case. So any questions before we get out of here? Like I said, I'll be posting that second homework assignment. Um, I would suggest relative last time, try working on that early. Right, try to, some of it towards the end, we'll kind of finish the discussion up on Thursday. So you probably can't sit down and do the entire thing, um, but you can get pretty good chunk of the way through it. Uh, I think there's seven questions. You should be able to get through the first five or maybe even six after today. So any questions for me? All right, we will see you guys on Thursday.